Wow. Okay, a couple of things to talk about. First of all, you got this making a murder uh, defense attorney who got booked in jail. And then you have this Jody Arias case. I have two great guests with me here today. Yusha Gunasekara, who is a law and crime trial analyst and also a public defender. And the one and only Joseph Scott Morgan, uh, who joins us as well. Let's talk really briefly about this Jody Arias case. She wanted to keep her appeal secret. That's kind of odd, right? Like, why would she care if the public knew uh, what, what the case she was for making for her appeal, Yosha? She was definitely worried about the negative media attention. I mean, everyone knows the Jody Arias case, and she didn't receive a lot of positive publicity. So what she's really worried about is the negative public backlash here, and she didn't want people to read any of her appeal. But that, you know what, when it comes to an appeal, it's not like you're dealing with a jury here. That doesn't really matter, right, Joseph? No, it really doesn't. Uh, I think uh, one of the one of the issues here is that she's she's worried about public perception, um, which just kind of knocks me back here a little bit. Uh, her, when, we're showing her smiling mugshot, Joseph. Yeah, I know. When uh. you could see when you could see the brutality of that crime scene, which I covered for a year, probably over a year, on CNN and HLN, it was absolutely horrendous uh, what she did to this man. And I can say now she did it to him. She's a convicted murderer. Let's keep that in mind. Uh, aside from all the conspiracy theories and all the things that I've been hit with over the years relative to who actually killed Travis Alexander, she did. And that blame and guilt is at her feet. Uh, still to this day, uh, this narcissistic behavior continues with her. And uh, it's very tired. Yeah, well, she wants to keep her appeal secret. It's not going to happen. A judge said no. And she also has now an extension to file that appeal. It will certainly be interesting to see what her legal arguments are when she makes that appeal. We'll be watching that case very carefully. Now I want to turn to another case that we're going to be taking a deep dive into here on the Law and Crime Network. And that is the horrible murder of Timothy Co Coggins, who was murdered back in 1983 in a small town in Georgia. There he is right there. Uh, prosecutors say he was murdered because he was seen um, socializing with a white woman. He was stabbed multiple times, brutalized, and then his body was dragged uh, on a truck. It's just a really horrific case. We're going to take a deep dive into that case today, and I want us to start with the prosecution's opening statements. Take a listen. That was Chief Assistant District Attorney Mary Broder describing what she called an unspeakable horror of when that 23-year-old man, Timothy Coggins, was murdered back in 1983. But this is 2018, and the man accused of murdering him is finally, finally going to trial. Uh, it's really an amazing case, especially because when you consider over 34 years, all of the differences in crime scene investigation, uh, the prosecutor pointed out the fact that DNA wasn't even discovered until 10 years after this crime was committed. I'm here with Yosha again and Joseph Scott Morgan on the Skype line. What do you make uh, of some of what the prosecutor said during these openings, Joseph? Yeah, she's right. She contextualize the evidence and isn't that interesting how this is a peek into the past using modern technology um, you know we've there's been a, a lot of a lot of water that's passed beneath the bridge metaphorically over the years relative to this Alec Jeffries uh, you know in 85 first you know began to discuss the utility of DNA and was successful in using it in the UK uh, but it would it would be some time before it ever made it into courts in the U.S. But this is important, and we have to keep this in mind in this particular trial. You're not trying this case in 1983. Uh, those crimes were committed back then. But this man is being called to account for his actions or his alleged actions now in 2018. And there is just a bevy of physical evidence. At first, you know, we heard that evidence was lost, uh, you know, and that uh, there would not be any viable evidence. I think that that's quite the contrary. Uh, there was a significant amount of evidence that was brought forward in this case. 
And, and we're seeing and some of that in those pictures there. Uh, Joseph, I, just, I want to get to Yoshi in a second, but I want to ask you, because we think you're a forensics expert, and we think of forensics as more of a modern, t you know, kind of field. However, you know, back in 1983, forensics did exist as well. Yeah. And what was the type of, you know, what did investigators do back then? Um, obviously, this, this case was closed then uh, within two to three months. Um, but but walk me through how, you know, things have changed. What was it like back then in terms of dealing with forensics in an investigation like this? Yeah, you know, don't 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 get me wrong. The people that were involved in it uh, back then were still just as passionate and they they had an interest in seeking justice. Uh, but they just didn't have the tools that we have today. Uh, that doesn't mean we dismiss what they did. They did the best they could. And obviously they collected quite a bit of evidence. Um, I think, you know, looking back, we didn't have DNA, obviously, as we previously stated, but for blood evidence, one of the things that we would turn to was serology, which is the study of bodily, bodily fluids. That's, you know, uh, blood, urine, semen, uh, vomitus even, uh, fecal matter, these sorts of things so that we can type and tie back. That's the whole key to forensics. We want to be able to tie things back in kind of a web, an intricate web. And so that's one of the things that we think about. Um, in addition to that, uh, just keep in mind, this is a Georgia court. We were just coming off of the Wayne Williams uh, case, uh, the missing and murdered children. That was a landmark case in forensic science because that's the first time that fiber evidence was mm. used. And so that's in the just it, over, over their shoulder in the rearview mirror. They're just past that point now at that particular time. And so a lot of things have changed. As a matter of fact, you know, now we contextualize fiber evidence and hair evidence and all that sort of thing. They're having a hard time getting in court sometimes. But, you know, it's a learning process as we go along. And uh, we've certainly learned. And it's uh, uh, what, what astonishes me about this particular case is the fact that they were able to hold on to so much. And, and, and I want to talk now, uh, you can see we're showing some of what they actually did have, 50% uh, of the evidence from back in 1983 was lost. Uh, the GBI testified to that, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. Yosha, you're the defense attorney in this case. I mean, it, you know, it, there are there is some strong evidence, but it's not a slam dunk. Oh, there, it's not a slam dunk by any sense of the word. Cold cases are incredibly hard to prosecute for exactly the reasons that you just said. In this case, a lot of evidence was completely destroyed. And the evidence that was left, we don't know how that was preserved. Uh, and again, a lot of this case, this entire case, in fact, is circumstantial. And I think that that is a concern. Of course, what happened to Mr. Coggins is horrible. It's an unspeakable tragedy. But we need to make sure that we're getting the right person in this circumstance. And what I found really interesting about the opening statement is that it sounded a little bit more, at least the beginning sounded a little bit more like a closing statement because mm. it was a lot of an emotional appeal. And you want to make sure that the prosecutor is not just going to focus on emotion, but really the facts at hand. Because remember, an opening statement is to preview the evidence. Well, very interesting. And that's one of the defense uh, strategies throughout this case really to hone in on the fact that you know 50 percent of the evidence was lost um, memories are foggy and, and there were some uh, a lot of problems with the initial investigation we're going to take a quick break but when we come back you're definitely going to want to stick around because we are going to hear from the victim's sister in this case we'll be right back that we're following out of georgia Timothy was only 23 years old when prosecutors say back in 1983 he was stabbed to death and then chained up and dragged in a, uh, at the, dragged by a car. Very, very brutal death The prosecutors say was racially motivated. Very, very interesting stuff because we were just hearing from the sister, Yosha, um, and she was recounting she was actually there that night in the club and saw her brother dancing with a white woman. 
Yes, and, and this is especially important to develop the motive, the racial motive um, of the defendant in this case. But it also injects this very emotional factor. Um, this is a sister who has not had any justice for her brother. And, and you're, you're getting a sneak peek of, of what is to come, but then also just the past, how things were just even three decades ago, the racial divides that happen in the South. So it's really painting a picture for the jury you're getting the motive and then you're also getting that very emotional factor yeah and you know what's amazing about this Joseph Scott Morgan she testified to the fact that uh, at the time back in 1983 investigators never spoke with her never spoke with her and not only was she the sister of the victim which you think that they would have interviewed right regardless she was in the club that night yeah, that's powerful stuff, Rachel. And let me just interject something right here. That's one of the reasons I believe in what y'all are doing at Law and Crime. Uh, you know, in any other format, he would just be, uh, you know, contextualized where you couldn't really understand him. Here, or, or as a person, he, he didn't have any animos. In this particular case, they have got this sister up on the stand. You can see her here, and she breathes life into this young man that died this, this torturous death. And the fact that going back in time that they did not speak to her, they did not interview her at that particular time speaks volumes about uh, the way procedurally this case was investigated. So it's going to leave big questions in the minds of the jurors, I would think. Yeah, it's it certainly is. This is, like you said, very, very powerful stuff to hear from the sister and the fact that, you know, what a botched investigation, the fact that they didn't even speak with her. Um, one of the other interesting things is, you know, I've been kind of dying to know throughout this trial, um, who that woman was that he was dancing with. And we never find out who she is. I don't know if, if, if the prosecution was never able to figure out. Maybe she died. I don't know. Um, but she was never called as a witness. Um, how important do you think it would have been for the prosecution to get their hands on that woman? I think it that really... That bad, but you know I, what I meant. I, I think <laughs> it speaks to the overall weaknesses in this case, and I think it's what the defense needs to capitalize on. Now, it's terrible that they this case was not investigated properly, but the prosecution doesn't get that benefit. Memories change. So her memory of that night, some may say it's going to be seared in her mind forever, but it's literally decades later. And well, so the defense needs to capitalize on how memories fade. And it's, it's not their fault that the investigation wasn't done properly at the time. Very interesting. So one of the things that plays kind of a key role in this is the fact that Frankie Gephardt, the defendant, actually admitted to several people, including some jailhouse snitches, allegedly, that he did this. We're going to get into some more testimony when we come back, but first a quick break. Wow, such interesting testimony from Jesse Gates, the friends of the victim, talking about the culture in this Griffin, uh, Georgia, a very small town in Georgia, back in 1983. And what's kind of shocking about all this is we're not talking about the 1960s here. We're talking about the early 80s. And Yosha and Joseph Scott Morgan, my guess, you know, he's saying that in this small town, dating a Caucasian woman still was not acceptable. Yes, it's highly inflammatory testimony here. It's very important that the prosecution is getting this out, and it's very damaging for the defense. And it's a little surprising that we don't see the defense trying to object to this information because, again, it's painting a general picture of what's happening, but it's not really going to the motive specifically of Mr. Gephardt. Yeah, because we're really getting a sense of what it was like there. He's talking about there's KKK rallies. He's talking about the, the fact that, you know, uh, what, what was going on, how dating a, a white woman would be acceptable in Atlanta, but not in Griffin, Georgia. Perhaps uh, this information was let in because it was a discussion he had with the victim. And you also have the fact that he was with uh, the victim just moments before he was dropped off at the nightclub. He dropped him off at the nightclub, in fact. 
again, it's just important to really look at what is, if it's going to be more prejudicial than probative. Yes, again, it is a conversation that they had, but in my opinion, and of course it's coming from a defense attorney, that this is very inflammatory. We need to stick to statements that Gebhardt said about the, the racial motivation, and I, and I understand they're trying to paint the picture because it's, it is the 80s, it's not necessarily the 50s or the 40s, and I, and I understand that, but those statements are going to linger in uh, the jury's mind. I, you know, we just heard Jesse say, you know, he warned the victim, don't, you know, be careful dating white women. And that's going to stick with the jurors. Absolutely. Think, Go ahead, yeah, Joseph. Yeah, I think one of the uh, uh, particularly impactful things about this is that not only is this gentleman uh, a friend of the victim, but he is also, uh, at the time, was a law enforcement officer. Right. And I think that, that that's, uh, that's rather uh, interesting. Uh, and that he he facilitated uh, this young man's journey to the club, uh, where where this uh, this problem began. But he you know he's he's kind of intimating in they've given him a lot of latitude as you as you as you mentioned. Uh, uh, he intimated that there apparently had been an issue in his mind at least uh, with Timothy and his choices in the past. So this is this is not new ground he was covering with Timothy. Very interesting. We're going to get into more of his critical testimony, including what he saw and said in the moments leading up to when he dropped the victim off at that nightclub. First, let's take a quick break. That was the last time that night, 1983, that Jesse Gates saw his friend alive. Joseph Scott Morgan, what do you make of this testimony? Very powerful, especially coming from a former law enforcement officer. Yeah, it is, uh, Rachel. And again, I go back to this idea of breathing life into this case that uh, I would imagine some people had given up on all these years ago. Uh, I, I don't think there's an absence of compelling witnesses here or or. I evidence. absolutely agree. So sorry to cut you off, Joseph Scott Morgan. Yeah, sure. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with more testimony. And we wanted to play some of the, go back, I should say, to some of the prosecution's opening statements in the case of Frankie Gephardt because I wanted us to get specifically into some of his injuries. I'm here with um, Joseph Scott Morgan, who is a forensic scientist and was a medical examiner for many years, as well as Yosha. Uh, when you hear her describing some of these injuries, Joseph, what goes through your mind as a medical, as a former medical examiner, as you kind of examine this, especially the fact that, you know, it's so many years later that this is going to trial? Yeah, the, the descriptor that was done at autopsy uh, following this young man's death is going to be key. Uh, how effectively uh, was the examination done at that particular time? And back then, uh, this young man's body would have gone to the state medical examiner's office uh, with the GBI, more than likely. Um, now, I, I think that uh, there's a lot to unpack relative to uh, not just the extent of the injuries, but uh, the sequencing. Uh, how did these occur? And you have to be able to delineate uh, were these injuries uh, anti-mortem, which means before death, perimortem in the throes of death, or post-mortem, that is after the death has occurred. Because uh, this raises the specter, I think, um, of torture, and which is is a completely separate element, and and gives gives us this visceral feel of what this young man went through. Uh, we talk about stab wounds. I've heard this mentioned over and over again. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just stab wounds here, uh, relative to sharp force injuries. It's slicing wounds, uh, which implies, you know, the old the old adage about death by a thousand cuts. Uh, these are superficial and, uh -huh. and, and very painful, though, because the blade would have had to have been drug across the surface of his skin. So it, it, it's, it's a lot to unpack for all of us and for the jury to, to kind of uh, to understand and put in perspective. And, and just you uh, describing that kind of gives me a visceral reaction. Um, and we're going to get into some of the medical examiner's testimony in just a minute. But, Yosha, how does that weigh in um, for the, the jurors as they hear that? I mean, it's, it's really tough. I think everyone can agree, whether you're defense or prosecution, the way that this man died was horrific. But I think the point of this whole trial is to make sure that the person who actually did inflict those 
horrible injuries is the person that is found guilty. And I think that it's hard. It's hard in this case. And I, the defense is going to argue that. They're going to say that this is a terrible crime. The investigation wasn't properly done so many years ago. But that doesn't mean that an innocent man uh, should quote unquote hang for you know these crimes that he may not have done well know? we'll certainly see if he's an innocent man I don't know about that but let's turn now to the medical examiner's testimony very critical because you, you get a better picture of exactly what this young man Timothy Coggins suffered take a listen and I want to apologize there for not giving you a warning about some of that graphic content obviously very very hard to listen to I, I should say see and the camera shifted away uh, from that photo of Timothy Hawkins just because it is so gruesome and hard to, to look at. But of course, Joseph Scott Morgan, this is really your arena here. Um, you know, the jurors are seeing the, the, the picture there and um, it's really disturbing. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I think that uh, I think that that really drives home the point. Uh, it's probably an image that defense does not want to be seen uh, in my estimation. Uh, but uh, it, 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 it was seen before the, the open court, and it really paints a picture of what this young man went through. That was just one image. I'm sure that there are a myriad of these images that are going to be presented in court relative to this case. Uh, the ME is going into a descriptor, just kind of laying the groundwork. A lot of people get confused uh, when we talk about injuries, and you kind of have to uh, simplify this thing. We're used to talking in these terms with one another that are highly technical, uh, but that's that's the thing about forensic pathology and investigations is taking, uh, uh, you know, natural science and breaking it into applied constructs so that the jury and people in the court can understand them. And so thus far, he's done a pretty effective job. Yosha, your take on this again? I mean, you know, this is kind of the stuff you have to get in as a prosecutor, but uh, especially in a case like this, it's so heinous. It's highly graphic, but we're seeing more of this, these photos and videos of injuries actually come in in the case. So it's not particularly surprising, but again, it's going to leave a very lasting impact on all the jurors. All right, let's take a quick break. When we come back, more from the medical examiner in this cold case out of Georgia. We'll be right back. All right, just horrible stuff to listen to. This is the medical examiner describing the inner, uh, excuse me, injuries that Timothy Coggins suffered that day he was murdered on 1983. Defendant Frankie Gephardt is on trial for murder. This is the trial we're watching. Um, Joseph Scott Morgan, uh, he's an expert in this area. He's with me via Skype. Joseph, I got a question for you about this because this is a cold case, right? Happened in 1983. Uh, why you're seeing the, chair, the witness chair as opposed to the guy talking for a lot of it is because we didn't want to show some of these really graphic pictures of the dead body, but Warren Tillman, he's the medical examiner. I, I'm kind of curious, and I don't know the answer to this. Maybe you do. I, I assume he was not the original medical examiner that looked at Timothy's body. So he, is he making all of these assessments through pictures that he saw? Yeah. Yeah, provided that he wasn't uh, the original medical examiner uh, that was on the case, he would have to go back and kind of interpret uh, the findings of the ME at that time. And I, I don't know if he was the uh, pro sector of, of record in this particular case, but he's having to go back, if that is the case, based upon somebody's notes uh, relative to this, as well as the uh, photographic, photographic evidence that he has at his disposal. Does that make it, I mean, because I'm, I'm sure maybe you've consulted on cases where you've only seen pictures and you read the ME's report. Does that make it a bit tougher to make an assessment of what happened, especially in a case like this where, it, you know, it's not just a one bullet wound uh, situation. You have what really can be described as a torture that went, went on. Yeah, if he was not, if he was not the pro sector of record, then yes, uh, it does make it particularly difficult because, you know, uh, you, you want that person there. Uh, and so you're having to rely on notes that were made uh, potentially in someone else's hand. Uh, even, even uh, you know, the scribblings that you have uh, that come from autopsy. Remember, even autopsy notes are, are, are subject to be subpoenaed. And these things are done in a fever many times. Uh, in very adverse uh, conditions, might I add. Uh, and so you would have to be relying upon the documentation that took place 
all that time ago and breathe life into this. Uh, as Because let's keep in mind, uh, there is nobody on the face of the planet, no crime scene investigator, no police officer, not even the parents that can speak to these injuries like the medical examiner slash pathologist that did the autopsy. They actually had physical contact with this body, bore witness to the evidence of this trauma and everything that this uh, young man had gone through. And Yosha Gunasakara, who's a criminal defense attorney here with me as well, when you go into the medical examiner's testimony, obviously this becomes a bit of a difficult time for the defense. You don't really see, at least so far when we've been listening to the uh, testimony, you don't see too many objections. Where do you go at it in terms of cross-examination here? Well, you really want to go into the pictures themselves. Mm -hmm. As you pointed out, uh, this whole testimony is based on pictures from a shoddy investigation. So we don't even know the quality of the photos. So one of the most important things you want to do is you, you want to cross uh, the medical examiner on the fact that he has no direct knowledge and, and just poke holes in the testimony um, because, again, he's just basing everything that he is seen and testifying to on photos. Okay, my guests are going to stick with me a few minutes longer. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to delve even deeper into this cold case murder case in Georgia. Stay with us. And welcome back to the Law and Crime Network, where we cover some of the most high-profile trials and cases going on across the country. Today, we are taking a deep dive in, into a very important cold case, a trial that happened just shortly uh, about uh, Frankie Gephardt, who was facing murder charges for killing uh, in what was termed a racially motivated murder for brutalizing, for lynching a young man by the name of... Timothy Coggins. Uh, right now, we're in some of the medical examiner's testimony, so let's get back to that. Injured any weapon identification as to a specific type it, of It certainly could. That's why I don't only describe that in one of the wounds in, that I saw a sharper margin uh, on the inferior aspect. And it, by, by that, if you take a knife, and the top would be the superior, the blade portion that's sharp would be the inferior. So if the inferior portion of the wound is sharp, that means it's cut the skin in a sharp, and because the blade at the top is not sharp or wide or whatever, you see more of a rounding area as opposed to a sharp edge. Okay. And were you able to, I think in your report it says it's one and a fourth inch or something along those right. lines? Okay. Right. So we're not talking about a large no, sir. object here. And um, the lacerations on the head that opposing counsel refers to in um, your diagram, you mentioned a, a club and asked you if it could be caused by a club. Could this have been caused by a head dragging on the ground? Yes. Behind a motor vehicle of some sort? Yes, because it would be pressure against the skin, which causes it. And I'm joined now by Joseph Scott Morgan, a forensic scientist, and Yosha Gunasakara, a law and crime trial analyst and a criminal defense attorney. We're listening to some of the medical examiner's testimony, talking a little bit, Joseph Scott Morgan, about decomposition in this case. Yeah, and, and this is significant because, uh, you know, decomposition, as unpleasant as it is to discuss, uh, is is key because this gives us an indication of time. Uh, if you remember the gentleman that was on the stand, the medical examiner was referring to uh, that he had made note uh, that there was larval development or maggot development uh, in some of these wounds or around the eyes. And this is not uncommon. And what, what happens with this uh, is that we can peg a time not not like they do on television where they can give you, you know, up to the second, uh, but it, it, it brackets this time frame for us. So this is a measurement of time. When we go out as investigators and attempt to uh, question an individual about uh, time frame, uh, this allows us to either uh, uh, validate or invalidate an alibi, for mm. instance, based upon the science that we have at hand. So what I'm not clear, and I was looking up, and if anyone knows, any of our producers know, let me know, but he disappeared from the nightclub. Obviously, he was found sometime after that. You talk about some of the larvae development on the eyes, which is an indication that perhaps he was found several days, perhaps, uh, perhaps after he disappeared. 
because of the decomposition? Yeah, it's potential. And, and again, you have to take into account uh, the environmental conditions, heat. Heat always speeds mm. things up. Keep, you know, you learn that in eighth, eighth grade science. Uh, heat always uh, speeds things up. So in this context, uh, we would want to take all of that into account, Rachel, as we're trying to make a determination as far as, as timeline goes. Also, this goes to evidence collection. Yoshi had mentioned uh, uh, maybe poor investigation in this case. Uh, did they collect larval samples at mm. the scene to show the life cycle of these flies as they kind of spin in and out of the cycle, various generations and that sort of thing? That's something else that we look at to establish a timeline as well. And Yosha, again, we talked a little bit earlier about this. Uh, the medical examiner's testimony is always tough when you're the defense attorney because there's not a whole lot to refute here. It's kind of like, well, this is what was found, right? Yes. So, I mean, you already have um, the body in a state of decay at close in proximity to the time of the crime. And so now, it, again, the defense has to focus on how hard it is to just recreate that. Because at the time of the crime, the body was already decomposed. And as Mr. Scott just said, have they been preserving the larvae? Have they pre been preserving integral pieces of evidence to move forward here? And I, I think they haven't. And I think that's what the defense needs to capitalize on. Yosha, you made a perfect segue to our next witness on the stand, Larry Peterson, a crime scene analyst. He talks about what specifically was found at the crime scene, including hairs recovered at the club. Let's take a listen. Very interesting because he's going through some of the evidence that was found all of these years later, Yosha, that leads me to possible pro uh, problems the defense can pick up on. Oh, definitely. So much of that was never tested. For example, the Caucasian hair was never tested and perhaps it would <laughs> exonerate um, the defendant in this case. So it it's going to be interesting to see how they proceed. Joseph Scott Morgan, um, I know you both have to go, and I want to thank you so much for joining us. Real quickly, though, before you have to leave, why do you think the, the prosecution was making um, that investigator describe the terminology? Uh, I found that kind of interesting. Uh, the world that we live in nowadays, uh, those, those terms have been used in anthropology for years and years. They're descriptor terms. Uh, and you have to, you know, I, I, I teach at Jacksonville State University when I talk about uh, when I talk about uh, uh, forensic anthropology, I have to couch it because people will uh, be offended or whatever the case might be. And I, I think that that's, that's probably uh, the reason that they, that they went that direction, uh, having to explain it so that no one was offended and they understood context. Why they were using these kind of scientific words. Well, right. thank yeah. you. Thank you so much, Yosha and Joseph, for joining me this morning. Really appreciate all of your insights. I uh, hope you're back on the program shortly. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk more about the degradation of some of that evidence because this is a case that happened over 34 years ago. Stay with us.